Does everybody see my presentation up there? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about interpreting the tag, talk a little and um, just the basics part of it. And then Dr. Balad will go into the more um, serious stuff about uh, coagulation. So the agenda for me is to discuss clot formation in vivo and in vitro because uh, it's important to understand the distinctions between the two relative to what you're actually getting as um, an information. And then a little bit into viscoelastic coagulation testing. Again, the basics, specifically looking at the tag, the thromboelastograph. A look at the measurement parameters, as well as a little bit of on, on how to interpret them. And then we'll go through and do a little interpretation practice. So again, just the basic, basic stuff um, and how to interpret what the tag is trying to tell you. So first of all, I like to talk about, when I talk about uh, viscoelastic uh, measurements, I like to talk about what actually makes a good clot in vivo. Um, and basically there's four, what I feel are four different uh, factors. Number one, you have to have appropriate activation and a location for the clot to happen in vivo. It doesn't happen in the blood. It happens along the, the, uh, the wall of the vasculature. Then what has to happen is thrombogeneration generation has to get beyond a certain threshold for clot formation to go completely forward and to completion. And then um, after it reaches that threshold, you get rapid thrombogeneration generation or a thrombin burst, where then from there you can make and create the fiber network, which is going to cause the clot to be stable, um, increase the strength of the clot, and then allow it to be stable enough in its position so that it can do wound healing. So let's look at some of those things. So what uh, makes a clot, good clot in vivo, first of all, is the activation. And activation occurs at the zone of injury um, it, on, uh, in the vascular wall. And it's two things that are activated. The platelets um, become uh, adhere to the zone within that zone of injury um, and then activation. So they adhere and then they become activated and they're going to generate or they're going to um, be the location for the thrombin generating or they become the thrombin generating surface. Um, and then secondly, what happens is that the coagulation cascade that you all learned in biochemistry does get activated, but it's mostly just the extrinsic pathway um, being activated by tissue factor, which comes in from outside the vasculature and under normal circumstances. Then what happens is, like I said, is the thrombin um, generation gets started with those two activation um, steps, and then um, and then it gets beyond a certain threshold. And this is demonstrated here as here on the y-axis is thrombin generation with along the uh, x-axis is time. The red is actually thrombin generation, and blue is clot formation. And if you can see, you can see that thrombin generates. Uh, along a certain timeline it, and then starts coming up. And you see that it really don't get clot formation started until it reaches a certain threshold. Once it reaches that threshold, then it just, um, the thrombin burst that occurs allows clot formation to occur very quickly. A couple of things that are happening prior to that threshold is that, as you know, there's always an anticoagulant and procoagulant forces that are trying to maintain balance. Prior to the threshold, the anticoagulant forces are stronger than the procoagulant forces. But once activation occurs with the platelets and the tissue factor on the coagulation pathway, the, uh, the procoagulant forces overcome the anticoagulant forces, which then allow clot formation to occur. And then at threshold, what happens is actually there's two positive feedback loops that are activated, um, and it's activated by thrombin. The first of all is more platelet activation in the aggregation and then accelerated thrombin generation. So thrombin is actually required to positively feedback the whole process. All right, next is rapid thrombin formation beyond that threshold. And what happens there? You get localized thrombin generation. And once you get localized thrombin generation, you get localized fiber and fiber network creation or uh, structural uh, formation. 
So that's important to make sure that you have the um, stability of the clot. And then finally, you get strength and stability. And here it demonstrates that for strength and stability, you need platelets, fibrinogen, and that fiber network. And as you see, fibrin, fibrinogen, I mean, is absolutely required for both of those. Fibrinogen is required for platelet aggregation. And it's also required as the fibrin precursor so that you get fibrin network formation. And once those things are in place, the clot will stay in place and then allow for uh, wound healing to occur along with the, the, uh, the vascular wall. So that's what it takes to make a good clot in vivo. We see that what's required are platelets, the platelets and the coagulation uh, pathways, both the extrinsic and the intrinsic. You need the coagulation factors to generate the thrombin. You need an environment free of anticoagulants. You need platelets free of uh, platelet inhibitors and fibrinogen. And then finally, an environment free from plasmin, which is your uh, activating factor for fibrinolysis. And this is just kind of a cartoon showing this. Again, the, pla- the vascular surface, the platelet activation um, on the vascular surface um, causing, and then also the thrombin or tissue factor activating the coagulation act, uh, factors or pathways. Then you get thrombin generation, which comes back positive feedback to platelets and the coagulation and again, once you get that a sufficient thrombin generation, then you get fibrin formation, fibrin network formation, and finally the blood clot. An important factor to understand um, in this in vivo environment is that if there's platelet inhibitors, if the patient is taking platelet inhibitors, it inhibits um, uh, coagulation because it doesn't allow the platelets to attach or to stick to the surface. And therefore, if you don't get platelet sticking, you don't get platelet activation, adhesion, and all this whole process here to occur. And so that's how platelet inhibitors work in vivo. All right. So how does all this relate to monitoring with TAG and why do I even bring it up? Well, um, first of all, the TAG provides observation of the clotting process in vitro, of the entire clotting process. And in this is just, again, kind of a cartoon, just showing slightly different of what's going on in vitro. In vitro, we activate at the, coag- at the coagulation fa- uh, cascades by adding an exogenous activator, which it can be tissue factor or for the extrinsic pathway or um, kaolin for the intrinsic pathway. You get trauma generation. Once trauma is generated, now it activates the platelets as well as goes and reactivates and causes the rapid uh, thrombin generation via the intrinsic pathway um, to keep this cycle, this positive feedback going. And then you get fibrin formation, fibrin network formation, and finally the blood clot. Relative to that, platelet activation by thrombin here versus the vascular surface that happens in vivo overrides the inhibition by platelet inhibitors, like uh, Plavix and such, which is why sometimes you don't see the effect of platelet inhibitors in the in vitro situation. And so it's important to understand why we may or may not see the effect of platelet inhibitors. All right, so in vitro testing, a couple caveats. Number one, you're only testing the blood. So whatever's in the blood is what's being, and its contribution to clot formation is what's being measured. And again, as we indicate, as I indicated, you start monitoring at the thrombin generation phase or the coagulation phase. Um, and again, you're adding an exogenous activator. With the intrinsic uh, pathway, you add kaolin, which gives us the basic TEG um, uh, tracings that we normally see with the TEG 5000. And if you um, use a tissue factor, you'll activate the extrinsic pathway and that's what they do, um, or one of the factors that are used to activate um, and to show the rapid tag, which I won't be talking about today. I'll mainly be just be talking about the, the basic tag. Um, all right, so in this situation, the platelet now doesn't have, is not a primary activator of clot formation, rather it's playing a cofactor role. And as you can see from the um, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways here, 
the platelets are have always have been play, uh, in this uh, assay conditions um, playing as a cofactor. Um, and so that's where they're at. And then also I wanted to pay, make sure you pay attention to the fact that you also need calcium as a cofactor in these situations. So if the patient is low on calcium, you may not get good coagulation because of that. All right. So what does in vitro testing do for you? Number one, it provides information on the potential of blood components to form clot. So it just is showing the potential of the blood components to form clot. Um, and the advantage is by doing that, you can identify some of the missing blood components if the blood does not clot. If the bleed, if a patient is bleeding and you see an abnormal tracing on the tag with this in vitro testing, you can pretty much indicate which component is missing. Um, and then add that component and hopefully stop the bleeding. The disadvantage of in vitro testing is that you may not be able to see everything. We're not measuring everything. Again, remember, we're missing the vascular component. And so what can happen is that you could still have a perfectly normal tag, but you might have suture deficiency if the hole is too big to, for the clot to form across that. Um, again, as I indicated, you could have some vascular endothelial dysfunction or platelet dysfunction such that the platelets don't stick. Again, if the platelets don't stick, you're not going to get good clot formation. An endogenous inhibitor of some sort, such as nitric oxide, you could have um, platelets not sticking. And then, of course, also, uh, many of us know as perfusionists that, um, and as you're getting ready for the patient to go up to the ICU, you might want to make sure that the pressure never gets above too much because that could tear the, the clots away from and re-cause bleeding. So it's not necessarily a deficiency of the process itself, but just of the stability of that clot. And as I indicated before, you cannot see, at least on the TIG 5000 with the kaolin activated, you can't see the platelet inhibitor effect. You do need to use a modified test called platelet uh, mapping for that. Okay, so a TIG technology, again, for those not familiar with it, you use whole blood. Um, you can either use it straight from the patient right into uh, the cup of the situation and monitor it, or you can citrate the blood, send it to the lab, and then have it reconstituted in the lab so you can still monitor the tag. It monitors clot formation um, from the time it's initiated to the final clot, uh, maximum strength of the clot. And then if there's fibrinolysis, you can actually see that. Um, that's what I mean by and beyond. Just to, as a caveat, the routine clotting time, such as the PT, PTT, all you're looking at is initial fibrin formation. So only the initial part of that uh, whole clotting process are you seeing with the routine clotting times, which is probably why they don't always correlate with what we see with the TEG. What are some of the monitor, the parameters monitored with TEG technology? We can measure the clotting times, just like with the routine clotting time, except it's a little different. Um, time to initial clot formation, which we call initiation. Secondly, we can look at the rate of clot formation, which is going to give us some information about thrombin generation, how fast it's being generated, as well as how fast the fibrinogen is being converted to fibrin in the fibrin network. Thirdly, we can look at clot strength. How strong is the clot in its ability to withstand those uh, pressure and flow uh, effects in the vasculature? And there it's mostly related to platelets and fibrinogen concentrations. And then finally, clot stability, which is the how long the clot will stay there um, to allow it to do its work of um, wound healing. And so basically, clot stability means no fibrolysis or very little fibrolysis, and it's also related to clot structure, as we'll talk a little bit about. So that's what TEG technology can give you. And so let's look at what the basic TEG tracing will show you. So this is a kind of a cartoon version of what a TEG tracing looks like. Um, we, the first half is coagulation process. And then once it reaches its maximum uh, strength, then if fibrolysis is present or active in the blood sample, then you'll see that clot breakdown. And again, here are all the, the 
the different parameters tested, and I'm going to go through the. Where'd she go? What happened? Uh oh, we lost you, Julie. Uh oh, oh. Well, let's let this, let's let everybody know we have a technical difficulty. Um, technical? No. Just wait one second. Difficulty. Uh, we, uh huh. Lost sound. Lost your sound. Julie, can you hear us? If you can, give us a sign. Mm -hmm. So what do we want to do? Um, yeah, hey, Julie, can you call in on the phone? If she can hear us? Mm. Call in to 281. Seven, put, put the, uh, here, 281-738. That was a good idea. 7906. 7906. Mm -hmm. Julie? Um, there she is. Hey, Julie, is that you? Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Hey, that was great idea. Studio audience once again came through, and uh, right. uh, so go ahead. You could do it on the phone like this, and I, we don't know what happened to your to your sound, but go on. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah, you might want to turn the sound down on your computer all the way. Oh. Oh, keep going. Okay, go ahead, Jules. Okay. It's good now? Yes. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Gotta love technology. All right. So, the basic tech tracing, we start with initiation, which is the R value, which is clotting time. Again, that's uh, that. Then we have the rate of clot formation. Again, that's associated with the rate of formation of the fiber network as well as thrombin generation. We also have clot strength, which is the maximum clot strength, which is your MA value. And then also clot stability and breakdown, which typically is defined by the LY30 value. Under normal circumstances, um, this is what you're mainly going to be associated with in the operating room, at least very infrequently in my experience that I see fiber alliances. It's somewhat like porno. If you see it, you know you have it. And, um, but otherwise, most of the time, you're just going to be associated with R, the angle, and the MA value to uh, interpret the pit, what's going on with your patient. Um, and like I said, typically minimal fibrinolytic activity, mainly because most patients are treated with an anti-fibrinolytic agent also. So. All right, so let's look at what are some of the determinants of the parameters. The R value. The main determinants of this are going to be the type of activator you use, whether it's Kalin or tissue factor. Tissue factor is going to be very fast versus the Kalin, which is going to be a little bit slower. To activate. So the R value is going to be longer with Kalin versus with tissue factor. The main factor contributing to the R value is going to be your coagulation factors, your activity and um, availability of coagulation factors. Of course, assay conditions under most circumstances, they're pretty well um, normalized or standardized, but temperature, pH, calcium levels, as well as the presence of an anticoagulant can influence the R value. And then finally, platelets. They're going to be um, not a primary factor, but again, they're a, a required cofactor for activation of the coagulation pathway. All right. The rate of formation, which is your angle, typically your angle, um, is going to be influenced by your coagulation factors, mainly because you need those to generate uh, and then, of course, to generate the fiber network. 
Again, assay conditions, fibrinogen is going to be, uh, that's mainly offered as a coagulation factor, but sometimes it's looked at a little bit differently as a, uh, its own little factor. Uh, factor 13A is required, to, or fa factor 13 is required to be activated to get your fiber network, and again, platelet as your cofactor. Finally, we get to clot strength, your MA, mainly associated with platelet function and um, number um, due to its aggregation of those platelets. But again, for platelets to aggregate, you have to have fibrinogen. And, um, and again, factor 13A, because everything holding it together um, with the fiber network. And then finally, clot stability, the fiber alliances activation, which would be your plasmin levels. And then clot strength or structure, to a certain extent, will also influence your um, vulnerability to fibrinolysis. So if you have low thromba generation, oftentimes, you'll, even if you don't have a full on um, activation of fibrinolysis, you're still going to be vulnerable to any little bit of uh, plasma that could be in the blood and therefore to clot fibrinolysis. So it's something to keep in mind that if you don't have a really strong clot, that you're going to have, um, even though you might not see this type of fibrolysis, it's still going to be um, vulnerable to fibrolysis and breakdown. All right, so again, the TEG tracing, initiation, buildup, maximum strength, and breakdown along the x-axis is time. Amplitude is along the y-axis, which is along here. So let's look at that. So with the RK and angle, as we saw, the coagulation factors are involved. With fibrinogen is involved when we get to the K angle of A. The platelets are involved once we mainly get to the MA, but as cofactor, all these other ones. So basically what I was trying to show in this slide was that um, during the whole process of the clock, uh, you have all the, all the elements. Hey, hey Julie. Yeah. yeah, we're having some kind of strange feedback. Um, who, who, do you, who? Yeah, do you have your speaker muted? Your speaker, Julie? It is not. Um, yeah, it's still really bad feedback. Dr. Vala, do you have your speaker muted a or turned down a little bit? Maybe, can we mute her microphone? Dr. Vallad's? Julie, can you talk? Yep, I'm talking. Oh, we hear you. That's Is it. it. Per oh, that's good. That's perfect, Dr. Vallad. Perfect. Whatever you did, it's perfect. It may not have been you at all. It's just coincidental. But I think we're good. We got it okay. all? Okay, Julie, go ahead. I'm so sorry. That's all right. So basically what I wanted to show in this one oh, yeah. is that even that's though fun. these different uh, parameters have specific things that are contributing to it, um, in reality, all of the factors are interacting during the um, the coagulation process. So, all right. All right, so interpretation again, time versus amplitude. Um, when you're looking at a tracing uh, along the down along the x-axis here, you'll see the parameter, RK, angle, MA, LY30, and then other ones if you have it set up that way. The next one is line is the unit, minute, degrees, um, amplitude, or millimeters, percentage. The actual value that this tracing is giving you would be the next line. And then your normal range would be the last one. And the normal range is determined based on um, when you validate the peg when you bring it into your institute to get the normal range for your. So. All right, so when you start. With interpretation, a couple of questions you should always ask is what is the patient's status? Are they bleeding, not bleeding? Because we'll determine how you kind of look at the keg to try to get And then also always look at the patient that um, the patient has. Hey, Julie, we lost you again. Can you not hear me on my phone? Well, we I don't know what where the problem's coming from. The guys are trying to figure it out. There's some kind okay. of 
uh, you know, we're all coming from different parts of the country and you know how the internet is, I guess, feedback somewhere, but I think we may have got it figured out. Are we good guys? Julie, I think you just hung up on Julie. Julie, you there? Yeah, yeah, Julie's gone. No, she's not there. I'm telling you, I just, uh, yeah. I'll call her back. It's all right, we'll figure it out. Julie, can you talk? Oh, there she is. Yeah, Jules, go ahead. All right. We got you back. I think we're good now. All right. So you may want to start all over again with example one. Okay. Um, Okay, so basically this is, like I said, um, what is patient status? Always a good question to ask. Is there sufficient calcium for the patient at the patient level? And then, as I said, these are your parameters, the unit, your value, and your normal range. So one of the first things you do is to look to see which one's out of range. Um, And so in this case, the R value is out of range. It's greater than 9, which is your normal upper normal value. But all the rest are normal. So an interpretation of this tracing might be that you have slow initiation of the R value, which is your initiation, which could lead to a bleeding risk due primarily to the fact that you have low clotting factors. And so... um, you know, if the patient is bleeding sufficiently, you might need to add clotting factors in the form of FFP or whatever you have on uh, available um, to stop that from happening. Um, the other possibility in this case, because we look at what type of fa- uh, test we ran, which was just a Kalen activated test. If there's heparin on board, that won't, this, um, you won't be able to, I mean, this you don't know if heparin is actually causing this. So it could be anticoagulant present. So how do we figure out if the anticoagulant is present, in this case, heparin? So one of the ways you can do that is you have to use a specific assay condition where you use a cup and pin um, set up that is coated with heparinase. So it's going to eat away all the heparin that's in the blood sample and give you some uh, different... And then you run both the tests side by side on the... Take 5,000. So this is showing you the plain cup, which is without heparinase, and the green um, tracing, which is the heparinase cup. And then you get uh, factor results for both of these tracings. And as you can see, there's um, a provide that provides information about whether or not you reversed your protein. But in this instance, it suggests that there's a very small amount of heparin present. And the main reason is because the R value for the heparinase cup is less than the R value for the, the other um, the plain cup, suggesting that there's a little bit of heparin on board. If the patient is still wet and the surgeon is requiring it, a little bit more protamine probably would not be out of, um, of question. But on the other hand, if the patient's not really bleeding, you might not have to do anything. You can just wait and see. But now you kind of have some information as to what could the possible problem be. All right. So and this is another case with a little bit more uh, indicating a ch- difference between the protamine or the plain cup and the heparinase cup. In this case, uh, again, the green is the heparinase and the black is the plain cup. It's post-protamine. So now we look and we see that the R value for the black one, which is the plain cup, is 22.8, way high. And for the R value for the green cup is um, still a little bit high. The number, what the information from this that we get is that the heparin is not reversed. Um, So adding more protamine would be probably a number one type of treatment to do. And then you still have the potential for uh, low clotting factors because the R value is still a little bit elevated. So, again, you check, you reverse the heparin um, so that these both line up with the heparinase and the non-heparinase cup, um, and then determine if the patient needs. Is is they still bleeding? And if so, now you know if, if again, the R value is elongated, it might be a, a clotting factor issue. And so from that, you can get um, to the next stage. So 
The next example, um, again, just asking questions. What are the ones out of range? In this case, the three RK and LY30 are all within range, but it looks like the MA and the angle are both a little bit decreased, suggesting that it's either a platelet issue or maybe even a fibrinogen issue. And so now we have hemorrhagic risk due to low platelets, which is your MA value, um, either a number issue or a function, but typically both, number and function are going to be decreased and or low fibrinogen levels uh, relative to your alpha le uh, value. And so, again, you can figure out what the best uh, way to address this is. With now, with fibrinogen act with fibrinogen uh, concentrates available, maybe treating the fibrinogen first. Um, but again, that depends on your hospital and how you go about um, with your algorithm that you might generate. Example three. Now we have a little bit different situation. We have our value is okay, our LY30, even though it's a little bit, it's still within range. What we see mainly is a high MA, so an elevated MA, an elevated angle, and a decreased uh, K value. So the decreased K and the elevated angle suggests that you have a very rapid um, thrombin generation, fibrin uh, network formation, as well as high platelet function. And now we might be in a situation where we have hypercoagulable risk at risk for stroke or some other type of situation, due to plate, mainly due to platelet hypercoagulability, but you still have to worry about the possibility of fibrinogen issues in that case, too. So, again, looking at your patient, what are they at risk? Do they, are they at risk because of whatever procedure was done or their history? Are they going to be at risk for a stroke? If so, then you might want to do something to decrease the hypercoagulability of those platelets. Um, so, again, the tag can give you that information. Um, here's another example where uh, we have hypercoagulable risk due to enzymatic, which is that first part where you have the coagulation cascade aspect of it. You have a low, M, a low R, a low K, a high angle, and a high MA. So now we have both enzymatic hypercoagulation, coagulation, as well as platelet hypercoagulability. Now you have a couple options of how to treat this. You could hit the enzymatic pathway with an anticoagulant or potentially a platelet inhibitor. Again, looking at the patient, the conditions, and what are they really at risk for relative to that. And then example five, wow, everything's normal. So this, these are the best ones to have at the end of a case to um, if the patient is not bleeding. But what about if the patient, um, well, in this case, it just demonstrates in normal in vitro clotting. But what if the patient is actually bleeding? What can you gain, what information can you gain from the fact that you have a normal keg but the patient is bleeding? And so, again, this is where, why I kind of went over the missing elements at the beginning of the presentation, because now what are some of the missing elements that could happen? We could have a suture deficiency, and that's not going to show up on the TAG. Or we could have the platelet inhibitor, and, again, that's not going to show up on the TAG because, again, the platelets are being activated in the TAG sample with, by thrombin, which overrides most of those platelet inhibitors. So if you see a normal tag and patient bleeding, these are a couple things you can think about relative to that. So um, that is pretty much the end of the main part of the presentation. I can do some more examples unless you want to go with Dr. Vlad and go with her presentation. We can come back, and do did, some more examples if you wanted to. Did you want to do your, uh, Julie, did you want to do your test? I can do the quiz. I think we should do the. I think we should do the quiz, and we can always repeat the quiz. So right. I'd, I'd like to do that, and let's see if we can get any of these right. All right. See if I've been paying attention. Okay, using the tag decision tree, which is right here, which is kind of an algorithm made by Heman, Hemanetics, Heman, um, and such. 
What is your interpretation of the, uh, the tracing? Select all that apply. Okay, so um, so everybody out there, if you have, if you're watching it, see if you get the answer right, and uh, we're going to give you a few few minutes to look at it before I chime in and see how if I'm paying attention tonight or not. Um, okay. So number one uh, is probably has heparin been reversed. Um, I'm going to say it's normal. Yes, the heparin has been reversed. Oh, okay. So that's a question you always want to ask. Well, I mean, in this case, you can see because you have the heparinase and the non-heparinase one, um, and they're pretty much the same. So, um, yes, I would say the heparin has been reversed. So, other than that? So I'm see. going to pick normal in this one. Okay. So let's Exactly. All parameters are within normal range. So... Again, if the patient is bleeding, you know, it's probably a suture deficiency um, or, um, you know, if the patient was on platelets inhibitors. And again, you get that from the history. So, yes, All right, I got I'll one right. Next. Okay, question right. two. Somebody's keeping score, right? <laughs> All right, in this case, it's post protamine, it's a Kalen with heparinase sample. Patient is, uh, status is bleeding. So using the decision tree or just what you learned tonight, um, what is the likely interpretation and what uh, types of uh, treatments would you consider? Hmm. 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 Okay. Um. Huh. I'm, I'm, oh man. Okay, I'm gonna go with, uh, I'm gonna go with A, factor deficiency. All right, select all that apply. So that's the, the, the R value's too long. Right. Um, the, uh, let's see, I, I can't read that right there. The green one, uh, what's that right there? The green. Uh, it's a little elongated. It's, it's four point three, with four as the upper limit. Okay, so it's a, it's a, that's also a little long, and yep. the angle seems too shallow to me. Yep. Somebody guessed. Hold it. Somebody guessed. Hold. Let me see what they, what they, what. Let me go to the chat. Somebody said, "What's the MA?" They they picked uh, A, Meerkat Supreme picked A, and uh, wants to know what the MA is. Oh, it's thirty-eight point eight. Well, I agree with I agree with Meerkat. Oh no, he said maybe B as well. I'm going to stay firmly on A. I say it's A. All okay. right. All right. Let's see what it is. Oh, it's all three A, B, and C. I mean, based on the R value, you have a factor deficiency. Uh, based on the MA value, you have a platelet deficiency or dysfunction, mm -hmm. and then C value you have low fibrinogen levels. So possible treatments for this, likely the patient is bleeding, so you probably want to hit the platelets and FFP. Again, depending on how much they're bleeding, but both platelets and FFP would probably be necessary for this patient to stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to give that one to Meerkat. He wins that one. I was, I, I just said fact that everything. So I'd have given everything, we'd have given everything anyway. Would have given two two platelets, two right. two platelets, two FFP, and uh, ten pack of cryo. That's what we would have done. Okay, and it would have made sense based on the tags. The tags. But we wouldn't uh, have based it on the tag. We'd have just done, we'd have just done that. We'd have probably done yeah. that for the first one too, even if it was surgical bleeding. <laughs> And then when they continued to bleed, maybe we would have found something. But then they would have hidden it and said it wasn't really bleeding. So <laughs> let's go to number three. We know that we know the deal. All right. So now we just have the first about ten minutes of the tag. The patient's status is bleeding, um, <sighs> and it's a Kalen with heparinase. Using the tag, um, is the patient likely to require more protamine as a treatment for bleeding at this point in time? Well, I, I would say I would say no. That's correct. If the is the patient likely to require FFP, FFP as a treatment for bleeding? Oh, 
I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if somebody else answers that. Um, the R value, the MA. Um, so we I'm, only see the first part here. So yes, I'm. I'm going to say yes. Okay. What's R? Let's see. There's a somebody's R is asking. R six point four. So it's six point four. Yep. Six point four, Meerkat. Six point four. Let me type it in. Six point four. So, and the no answer FFP. Is, he said. Yep, that's correct. No FFP. It, the normal R values suggest that the factor deficiency is not the cause of bleeding at this point in time. Okay, so again, just by starting, you know, you don't have to wait for the whole thing to get done. You can start looking at what, as it goes, to kind of get an idea of what you're going to need if a patient is bleeding. So let's go to the next one. Um, this is, again, a patient is bleeding, paling with heparinase, so it's not a heparin issue. Um, they're in the ICU using the tag. What are the likely causes of bleeding in this patient? Okay. Uh, I, I would say, I'm going to say E. That looks like a perfectly normal tracing to me. You know what? It's pretty close to normal. I mean, the R value is just a little bit over the... Um, the normal range, but you're right. You probably, it probably, I would start looking at surgical bleeding first and then um, see what happens. But you know, they're going to argue with me about that. I mean, the fact yeah, is they're going to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> so they might want to give something because they're in the ICU and yeah, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But you know, that's, that's the thing. But, I mean, at least you have a little bit more information than you did without. So, anyway. So, if the plate is, it basically, if the patient is oozing, wait an hour, then repeat tag analysis. If they're bleeding profusely, that's a whole different situation. Sure. So sure. You kind of take it as you, it goes. So, all right. Fifth question. What is the interpretation? Mm-hmm. see. Okay, so the the R value is not too bad. The MA is low. Just looking yeah. at it, um, but it's within range. It's within, it's within range. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> huh. Okay, so I'm the gonna, angles, go ahead. The angle the is angle, yeah, the angle is narrow, is shallow. Right. So, so that's I, you. Okay, go ahead. So 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 it looks like I would say C, and Scott also says C, low that fibrinogen. Is, yes, and that is correct. So yes. cryoprecipitate, um, or if you have it available, the fibrinogen concentrate as a treatment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I need to write that down. I got a question about that too. I need to ask you. All okay. right. So, mm -hmm. you want me to go on? Um, no, I think I think okay. that was really. We could always come back and do a couple of more. I think we'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Vallad now. 